So today, you're going to be taking notes on electron configuration notation. This is going to expand upon the material we talked about yesterday with quantum numbers. We'll abbreviate this ECN for electron electron configuration notation. So there's a couple things that you're going to want to have out right now. <clears throat> One thing you're going to want to have is a blank periodic table like this. Another item that you're going to want to have is a blank uh, periodic table similar to the one we filled in yesterday with quantum numbers. And the last item you'll want to have out is that table of quantum numbers just for reference. So yesterday we talked about quantum numbers. And for quantum numbers again we had n which was the shell, l represented the subshell, m was the magnetic spin number, and s was the spin number. All together this gave the address or location of that last electron. Electron configuration notation is in some ways a little, a little bit more useful because this gives information about all of the electrons in the orbit. And then later on this year, we'll actually see how information from electron configuration notation can actually tell us about some of the features that the atom has. So let's take a look at electron configuration notation. So the nice thing is that our n or our shell, this stays the same. And then our L, this is going to become a letter. So really, we've kind of reduced the work a little bit here. We're just going to have an N, and our L is going to become a letter. So now I'm going to have you guys put together a little table. So we put down our three different L values from quantum numbers. I like the next column to be ECN for electron configuration notation. The next box in your table is going to be orbitables, or orbitals, excuse me. And the last is going to be the total number of electrons when full. So how big that this uh, subshell is going to be. So that's another thing we call these values in electron configuration notation. We're going to call these subshells. So the first subshell we're going to get to is the S subshell. Again, this is where L equals zero. So if you take a look at your quantum number table, you see that in these first two groups of the periodic table, this is where we find this S subshell. So what you can do, let's go ahead and take this blank periodic table and label that S. 
that's going to be our S region of the periodic table. So you can go ahead and circle that, whatever's helpful. The S subshell contains two, uh, excuse me, contains one orbital for a total of two electrons when full. So if you look, we have two groups and a total of two electrons can fit in that subshell. One, two. And another way to think about it too is if you look at your quantum number table, this M represents the number of different orbitals that's found in each one of your L subshells, and then these spin numbers represent the different electrons. So there are two different electrons, one that's got a negative, one that's got a positive spin, found in that orbit, that one orbital inside of the S subshell. Okay, looking at the region of the periodic table where L equals 1, we're going to call this P. It'll be the P subshell now. And this is going to contain three orbitals and have a total of six electrons when full. And if you take a look at your quantum number table, notice that where we have an L value equal to one, there is six groups across. And notice that we have three different M value numbers here, three different M values. Those represent the three different orbitals we find, and each orbital has a electron with a positive spin and negative spin. And let's go ahead and get that labeled on your periodic table as well. So this area right here, this is your P subshell. Remember, we got rid of this guy. We got rid of helium, and that moved over into the S subshell. So this is the P region, or the P block of your periodic table. Moving on, when we have an L value equal to 2, this corresponds to the D subshell. And there are 5 orbitals here for a total of 10 electrons in full. So again, go over to your quantum number table. And you see that wherever we have that value of 2, this is going to be the D block. Notice that 10 elements across, we have 5 different M numbers. Those represent 5 different orbitals that each have a positive and a negative spin number in them, indicating those different electrons that, take, that can occur there. So this area, the transition metal block, this is our D block. That's the D block. And then our last group, where L equals 3, this is the F block. So this is your rare earth metals. Seven orbitals for a total of 14 when it's, when it's full. So looking here, our rare earth block is 14 elements across, 14 groups. And notice we have seven different uh, M values. Those represent the seven different orbitals. Each one has a negative and a positive value. It's got a negative three, it's got a negative half in it, as well as a positive half. The positive one has both a negative spin electron and a positive spin electron. And something kind of just a little side bit here is when you're filling these orbitals, you're putting one in at a time. So this is a little kind of side note. So again, this is our F block. Of the periodic table. So that's, that's the major differences in electron configuration notation. Something that I do when I go into tests in chemistry is when you have a periodic table like this, and we'll give one of these to you in all your tests, I would go ahead and label those subshells in. So S, P, 
D, and F. Label those in. And when you go up to your test date, you can do this too. I'm going to provide you the periodic table. Go ahead and put that S, P, D, and F in right away. Um, just as a reminder to have that information ready to go in front of you. So something that's going to help you guys out as you start doing your electron configuration notation might be to do a few things like labeling your n values on the subshell sheet. So I would go ahead and put those on there. Your n values, because these are staying the same again. Recall that in the D subshell, the transition metal block, our n value drops by one. So this is three, four, five. And then in our F subshell, these are both right here, they drop by two values. So this is really four right here, and this is really an n value of five. And that might not be a bad idea to put onto your periodic table as well. So S, P, D, F, and put our n values on there. Okay, so again, I would have those periodic tables out next to you while we're doing this. So we're going to kind of sequentially go and element by element to show electron configuration notation. So let's take a look at hydrogen. So how we're going to indicate this, we're first off going to write our n value, our principal quantum number. Then, since hydrogen is found in the s block, we put 1s, and since it has 1 electron in it, we call it 1s1. So that is hydrogen representation. All of its electrons, it's one electron has an electron configuration notation. Something you might want to do off the side here, I'm going to draw a little bit, little atom right here. So there's our generic nucleus, and now with one electron we have, or 1s shell, we have hydrogen. Let's do helium next. So again, helium, we should really indicate is right here. It's found, has electrons in the 1s subshell, and there's a total of two of them found in that 1s subshell. So it's 1s2. Now we have a hydrogen atom right there. Okay. On to lithium. So again, we're showing the, the location of all of the electrons that lithium has. So a lithium atom has the 1s subshell filled, and also it has one electron in the 2s subshell. So how we write lithium. 1s2 to show that all filled up and then it has one electron in the 2s subshell so that's what that one is representing that there's one electron in that 2s subshell so this is showing all the electrons that lithium has on to our next element excuse me Beryllium. So again, if we're thinking beryllium here, we add another electron and we have to show all of beryllium's electrons. So it has that 1s subshell has been filled, and in the 2s subshell, it also is filled. It has 
two electrons in it. So that's where that S2 comes from. Move on to our next element. We're going to have to go across the periodic table to boron. So looking at the periodic table, we have all of that area filled behind it. So boron has another electron in that second level. But now we've moved into another subshell. So we write boron. It's got the 1s subshell filled, the 2s subshell filled. But now we've gone over into the p block here. It still has the n value of 2. We're still in the second shell. So we've got that s2 subshell filled. But now we've moved into the p subshell. We've got one electron. So again, that's showing all the electrons that boron, boron has. It has all the electrons that beryllium has, but then it has one electron in this 2p subshell. And we keep going. We write down carbon. Carbon has all of those electrons that boron had, but in that p subshell, notice that carbon is the second element in there, so therefore it's going to have two electrons in that P subshell. Moving on to nitrogen, it has all of those electrons, and since nitrogen is our third element in that subshell, it has a P3, so three electrons in that P subshell. And we could keep on going all the way across that shell until we get to neon. So neon would have all this stuff. It's got the 1s subshell filled, the 2s subshells filled. And since neon is all the way across in the P subshell, 2p subshell, it has a 6. So we've gone all the way to the end, and now that subshell is full. Let's continue on to sodium. So if we did sodium with a 1s2, 2s2 is filled, the 2p6, because we've gone past neon, we filled that subshell, and we moved into the third subshell. This will be 3s1 because it is the first element in the 3s subshell. Let's keep moving on. Moving on to sulfur. So let's take a jump over here. So over here at sulfur, it's the third element in the 3p subshell. But it has to, we have to show all of the electrons that come before it. So we have to fill up that s subshell, the 1s subshell, the 2s, the 2p6 subshell. We filled up the 3s subshell. We have to fill up a total of two. And then to get over to sulfur, it's four elements across that P subshell. So that is 3P4. So what kind of gets a little confusing is when we get to elements in this transition metal block. So take a look at where iron's located. And something to keep in mind is that our principal quantum number changes when we enter this transition metal block. So stick with me while I go over this. So things are really going to be normal as we pass through until we get to calcium here. 
alpha. Let's go over that. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. So if you're following along, 3p6 would get us to argon. We drop down to the 4s subshell right here. So we go 4s2, and again, the odd thing happens right here. When we move over into the d subshell here, we drop down our principal quantum number. And this will be, instead of 4d, this will be 3d, and we'll count our way over to iron. So iron is the... One, two, three, four, five, six. It's the sixth element on here, so it has six electrons in that 3D subshell. That's the way of getting into these transition metals. If we go far enough, if we get to this F block, we also have to take care of that as well, but I'll show you that in just a second. So if you're wondering, well, oh, man, these elements are getting really big, I'm going to be filling up the whole page. Well, there's a way to get around this. The other way you can do this is something called noble gas notation. And what you can do is you find your element, and then you find the nearest noble gas. So find the place where all the last noble gas where all the shells were filled. So iron, so just go backwards in the periodic table, follow your atomic numbers until you hit a noble gas. So notice that the noble gas that came before iron was argon. So what you can do is instead of writing all of this stuff, since all of this is the same as argon, we can go argon, put into brackets, AR, and then write the stuff that comes after it that gets us to iron. So we put 4s2, 3d6. So all this stuff, this whole line, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, that's all the same as argon. So in order to save time, we can just put that AR down and write the stuff that comes after argon to get us to iron. So that's noble gas notation. Another one we can look at, so say we want to do AU, that's gold. Look on our periodic table, find AU, go backwards from AU, find the last noble gas that we came across, so AU is atomic number 79, backwards on the periodic table, looping through our rare earths, and the last noble gas we run into is xenon. So if we wanted to write gold the quick way, we go xenon, and then we're going to have to still travel through after xenon to where we come across our, um, our gold. So let's start from here. So xenon, that takes us to right here. So xenon is atomic number 54, so we're at atomic number 55, cesium. So we put in there, next to Xe, 6s2, because we're in the 6s subshell. Then, following these atomic numbers, notice that we actually drop down next over here into our rare earth block. So then we go 4. F14 because we passed through here through this F subshell all the way. We're still not to gold yet. Gold's atomic number is 79, so we're still at 79. So then we jump back up here. And that takes us back, that takes us into our transition metal block. And we then would put a 5V, because 
wire transitional block again. That's our, quantum, our principal quantum number drops one. And gold is the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ninth element in the transition metal block. So that is 5D9. So that is electron configuration notation. So you should be able to go from looking at an element on the periodic table to figure out how to write its, its uh, total electron configuration notation. Or the other way that I'll have you guys work with this stuff is that I will give you a number like this or a value like this, the whole notation, and you have to tell me which element. Here's a little hint. The only thing you have to look at is this last value right here, this 5D9. So I could say, oh, okay, so I see all this stuff, and I'm like, okay, 5D9, where's that? So I'm in 5D, travel 9 over, and I'm at gold. So you don't have to look at really at anything besides this last value. So I hope that this stuff is helpful for you guys, um, and uh, I'll be back soon to answer any questions you guys have on this. Uh, in the meantime, you can ask uh, Mrs. Soderman for help or um, shoot me an email and I can try to help the best I can when I return. Have a great day.